So I think what we've accomplished here is really uh, the ability to establish for the first time both safety as well as feasibility as it relates to utilizing a kidney xenograft into a human being. And that's really never been done before. And what do I mean when I say that? So what we were able to do through the generosity of a donor family, we were able to take a human brain dead donor uh, whose organs were not able to be placed for transplant. And we enrolled the decedent in a study in which we took out the decedent's native kidneys and we transplanted two kidney xenografts. And these are kidneys that were genetically modified in the context of a pig host. Uh, and they were transplanted into a human. And how we generated safety and feasibility data is that we tested a couple of things that could not be done in previous work which involved non-human primates. The first is that we a priori predicted that the kidney would not hyperacutely reject at the time we restored blood flow to the kidney. And we did that by developing a novel cross-match assay. And so we were able to take blood from the decedent uh, and, and cells from the pig and demonstrate that we felt this would be a compatible transplant. And we were able to demonstrate that, and that's the first time that has ever been done. And the development of this novel assay is absolutely critical for us to be able uh, to use this widespread for a living human being population with end-stage kidney disease. Because you can imagine no one's going to go for taking a kidney if they don't know up front whether or not it's going to be rejected or not. So having that cross-match was critically important. The other thing that we did was we were able to test whether or not a kidney from a pig could tolerate an adult human environment. So non-human primates don't have the same mean arterial pressure, neither do pigs, as an adult human being. So we didn't really know if the vascular integrity would hold up, for example. And so by actually doing this transplant, we were able to show that you could take a kidney from a pig that had been genetically modified to humanize it um, and put that into an adult human and actually have it hold its integrity. So it reperfused normally, just like a human allograft did. The vascular anastomoses stayed intact. We didn't have any major bleeding episodes. All things that I think are really important for us to be able to establish in a preclinical human model uh, before we take this into living humans. I really think it is a reflection of what I would call our Comprehensive Transplant Institute, which is really just a giant team of professionals that are completely centered and focused on improving the human condition for individuals who face end-stage disease. Um, and so we did this through a unique collaboration with our transplant surgeons here at UAB, as well as our partnership with our organ procurement organization known as Legacy of Hope. And what we did was we said, you know, we really need to be able to test this in a human being, but we want to be able to do this without subjecting a living person to it, because there were really safety and feasibility questions that we hadn't been able to answer in an animal model. And so we approached the legacy of hope um, about the possibility of potentially being able to use a human brain dead donor. Um, whose family had consented for both transplant and research, but whose organs are, were ultimately not able to be placed for transplantation. Could we actually then approach a donor family about enrolling uh, their loved one in this study? And Legacy of Hope was very engaged around this, as of course one of their missions is to help end-stage patients achieve transplantation by finding organs and uh, sources of organs. And so we were able to do that, and by partnering with their family resource counselors, um, a family was identified uh, that it was the family of a um, human decedent, so a brain dead donor whose organs could not be placed for transplant. And we were able to approach the family about our study. And to say that they were remarkable is an understatement. The notion of allowing us to enroll their loved one in something like this, really one of the first of its kind, was truly remarkable. Um, prior to this moment, a preclinical human model had never been established. Uh, and so what the Parsons family has done uh, through this generosity not only really helped us move the field of xenotransplantation forward, but really, Mr. Parsons established for the first time in our medical history 
the concept of a preclinical human model. And this model, I think moving forward, can be leveraged to study safety and feasibility of all sorts of things designed to improve the human condition, whether it be a medication or a new surgical procedure, things where we can work out some of the logistics and kinks, understanding that that individual is brain dead, so we're not going to harm that individual, but to really get data that we can't garner from animal studies, but that are absolutely critical for us to feel comfortable bringing this into a living human being. And for that, I think we as a society and certainly as a medical community owe a ton of thanks to the Parsons family for being willing to do this. I mean, I think it completely revolutionizes it, right? I mean, we have an unmitigated crisis in this country um, and it is an organ shortage crisis. Um, if you take kidney, which of course is the focus of this, um, we know that there are almost 800,000 Americans with end-stage kidney disease, many more who have chronic kidney disease that will ultimately progress to end-stage disease. We also know that uh, when Joseph Murray did the first kidney transplant in 1954, 1954, shortly after, it was very obvious uh, that the survival benefit that is associated with getting a kidney transplant over remaining on dialysis it gives life back. Death on dialysis is about 5 to 15 percent per year and it's cumulative. You know, survival out to about eight years is only about 35 percent. So you can't live forever on dialysis. And we know that kidney transplantation is life-saving um, and that it gives people back not just longevity but also a quality of life. But what we also know is that we don't have enough kidneys to go around, whether you're talking about kidneys that come from deceased donors or even living donors. So of the almost 100,000 individuals who are actually on the kidney transplant waiting list, we only do between 20 and 25,000 kidneys every year. So that's just a huge gap between supply and demand. And you could argue that that gap is even greater if you look at the people who never even make it to the waiting list. So I told you only 100,000 are on the waiting list, but almost 800,000 people have kidney failure. So that tells you there are 700,000 Americans that never even make it to the waiting list. So if we can actually establish this additional source of organs, think about all the people that we can help. Um, some of the preliminary data out there suggests that about two-thirds of people will be compatible with these pig kidneys. Um, and so that really, I think, paired with aloe transplantation has the real potential to actually completely eliminate the waiting list and wipe out the organ shortage. Well, I think the next steps are to continue uh, these particular studies. I think there are more, there's more data to be gleaned from the preclinical human model. Um, it affords us the opportunity, for example, to do serial biopsies, which of course we can't do in a living person with that degree of frequency. Um, and I think there are additional questions that we can answer in terms of how to optimize immunosuppression around the time of transplant. And I think simultaneously there are things that this model cannot answer for us. I think trying to ascertain function in the context of brain death is always going to be very challenging. And I think ultimately we're going to need to move this into a phase one clinical trial in which we actually transplant these kidneys into living human beings. And what these early studies have done is what they're telling me is that I can do that in a feasible way, in a safe way. So I know I can put that kidney in and it's not going to immediately reject on the table. And I know that those vascular connections are going to stay intact and the patient's not going to bleed out. Those are really important things for me as a transplant surgeon to feel comfortable offering this therapy, even in the setting of a phase one trial. And this study has given us those data. And I think it's time for us to move to that next phase. Well, I think this has helped us continue the conversation with the Food and Drug Administration. So the FDA is going to regulate Xeno uh, because uh, it, the pig is a, 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 a product or a device. Um, and so I think what this does is give us additional preliminary data as we're asking the FDA for an investigational new device um, so that we can actually move this into a phase one trial. And we will do that under certainly the umbrella of our in, uh, uh, IRB here at UAB. 
It's a great question. You know, I think um, we've already begun um, filling out our application and are going to begin to have some conversations uh, with the appropriate, appropriate regulatory agencies in the coming months. Uh, but certainly, I don't want to speak to their timeline. And certainly, this is an important, uh, uh, this is really an important area. And they're going to need time to review the data and make sure that they think this is where it needs to be before it goes into a living person. And, and I should add to that, I think one of the things that regulatory agencies are going to want to know, particularly in an era in which we have COVID, um, is was there the transmission of any viral diseases or things like that from the pig into the human? And I, the other thing that these studies have allowed us to show is that that does not appear to be the case. So we were able to test the pig prior to procuring the kidneys and demonstrate the pig did not have any diseases that could be transmitted uh, to a human being. And then we were able to actually test the human decedent's blood to demonstrate that there were no pig-derived infections or diseases. And so those data are going to be absolutely critical for federal regulatory agencies to be able to review so that they can feel comfortable uh, hopefully approving the IND, which would allow us to then go into a phase one study. We've sort of named it the Parsons model, really to honor his legacy and what he and his family uh, chose to do at, at his death. And really what it is, is it's, it's the establishment of human brain death as a preclinical human model to study the human condition. And we've really never leveraged brain death for that, uh, for that reason. We've always used human brain death as a mechanism for um, getting organs for the purpose of transplantation. And what we're doing is taking that one step further and saying, can we do more with that gift? Um, and I think this is a way to do that uh, so that we can study other diseases as well. Obviously, I mean, they are extraordinary people. This is a lot to sort of digest and think through um, at the time of having just lost your loved one. I mean, it's a lot to process. Um, but I think importantly, Mr. Parsons had shared his decision to be an organ donor with his family. And I think that's the first step, is the family understood that this was important to him, uh, that he wanted to do that, that he felt that that was important for his legacy at his passing. Um, and so they uh, consented for him to be an organ donor for the purposes of both transplantation and research. And when it ultimately was deemed that his organs would not be able to be placed for the purpose of transplantation, um, they were open to the idea of exploring research opportunities. And so we were able to share with them our protocol, the intent, the purpose of the study. And I think what they, they, they talked a lot about his sense of adventure, um, his sense of wanting to make a difference. And I think for them, this was a way for, to really honor who he was at his very core. And in many ways for him to go out in a way uh, that he really sort of set things ablaze, if you will. And without question, he has done that by establishing the Parsons model, really, as the first preclinical human model. We have a world-class and state-of-the-art um, histocompatibility laboratory here at UAB. Um, the HLA lab, for short, uh, is really responsible for making sure that the tissue matches between donor and recipients. And so if you, you've got to have that match, otherwise, otherwise when you sew in a transplant, uh, the person will reject the organ within a few minutes of establishing blood flow. And of course, that is not an ideal outcome for anyone. And so every year they process thousands of these for us to be able to perform transplants safely here at UAB, at Children's of Alabama, as well as the VA hospital. And so we reached out to our director, Dr. Hopfeld, and said, hey, you know, we're going to really need this for xenotransplantation, and this doesn't exist. Can you help us? Um, and Dr. Hopfeld, along with her co-director, Julie Hoop, uh, worked tirelessly to develop this, um, and we tested this a priori um, and developed both positive and negative controls, but we never sort of put it to the full test. We'd only done it with cells. We'd never actually done the transplant to see if what we thought was happening was real. 
And so the, the Xeno transplant that we were able to do into Mr. Parsons, we were able to take his blood before we transplanted him, mix it with the pig cells and show a negative cross match. And so Dr. Hopfeld and Hoop were able to tell us, we think this is a compatible match. We think it's okay to proceed. Just like they do every time I do a human to human transplant. And then we were able to perform the transplant in Mr. Parsons and the kidney turned beautiful and pink. And within 20 minutes, it started making urine and it never hyperacutely rejected. And that is what every transplant is supposed to do. And it was amazing. And so we now had proof of concept that this cross match that we developed is in fact very accurate and that it can in fact predict compatibility between the pig xenograft and the human recipient. Full disclosure, you know, I am not um, the, the mastermind behind this. You know, I think there are a lot of people who deserve a lot of credit for developing these genetically modified animals that are humanized enough that they can actually be considered to have their organs transplanted into a human being. Um, I really was sort of brought into this as essentially a technician and uh, with some expertise in immunology, having run our incompatible kidney transplant program here and asked to really help work out a few of the kinks that, that had been identified in the non-human primate model and really help get this out of sort of the laboratory and into a clinical setting. Um, and, and so first, just the opportunity to be invited to do that has just been um, a true honor and I'm very appreciative of that. But I do wanna highlight all the people who have made this possible. I did not genetically modify this pig, um, but I could not be more excited for my patients. You know, I think the hardest thing as a transplant surgeon is knowing that I have this gold standard, this, this therapy that if it was a chemotherapeutic agent, everyone's minds would be blown. I mean, you could, a kidney transplant and it works like 95 to 98% of the time. I mean, there are very few therapies for the treatment of a disease that are that effective. Um, and it's curative, right? This is end-stage disease. So you're taking someone who has an end-stage problem, meaning the end of the line. If you don't fix this for them, they're going to die. And we have this amazing therapy known as kidney transplantation, and yet, there are only about 25,000 of them to go around in the U.S. every year, but I've got 800,000 people who need them. And the hardest part is seeing patients in clinic, waitlisting them, and know that they might actually die before I ever get an organ offer to even be able to transplant them. So the opportunity, the notion, the concept of being able to have a, literally an organ on the shelf that is just waiting there for the person who needs it is just overwhelming to think about and exciting for them. And I feel very privileged to be just a very tiny part of a really big puzzle that people have been working on for many, many years. Without question, I think UAB is completely and 100% committed to our patients. And in-stage disease in Alabama is a huge problem. Our citizens face high rates of end-stage kidney disease, and I think UAB's commitment to helping figure out creative ways to find more organs, whether it be getting behind the incompatible kidney transplant program and expanding living donation, whether it be launching the hep C positive into negative deceased donor program, or in this case, making substantial investments and in actually building out a xenotransplantation program that involves developing and building out a designated pathogen-free facility where these animals can be raised so that they, we can ensure that we don't transmit any viruses to humans from these animals is remarkable. And I think it's a testament to UAB's commitment to our community, to our patients, to the betterment of uh, the human condition in general.